You're listening in on an animated discussion about the new Batman adventures with two experts in their fields. I'm Joshua Unruh, superhero scholar. And I'm Caleb Masters, your friendly neighborhood film critic extraordinaire from the Cinematropolis.com. And today's episode is Critters. Critters. They're creepy and... Joshua, what was this episode about? Critters. Mm. And that they are big and weird. Okay, listen, friends... This is a really bad episode. <laughs> like, like exceptionally bad. It is a spectacularly lackluster episode. Like, the most interesting thing I can say about it is that if you just made a list of stuff on paper, I would look at that list and go, oh, I'm going to love this. And then this thing just does not gel. It just does not come together. I don't like it. Caleb, how do you feel about Critters? <laughs> Joshua? I watched this episode twice trying to not only do I not like it I watched this episode twice to figure out what there was to say about it and I just don't <laughs> that's the worst but that might be the most offensive part about this episode not only is it not entertaining save for a couple of really spectacular moments uh I also just like there's not like analysis there's not like things it's saying like it I tried I was like well, are they trying to talk about like the farm industrial farm industry i know though they're, they're definitely not talking about that uh are they trying to talk about like the the rural uh urban division no they're not trying no. to talk about that <laughs> are they trying to i don't think they're talking about anything i just this episode just exists it's bad it's very bad and there's not a lot to say about it so there you go yeah yeah we do okay we do have some new designs and some of the new designs are really good so we can talk about them and because this is definitely part of the high point in as much as there is one um so let's talk about farmer brown he is potentially interesting because i think if you just again if you just kind of made a list on paper that friction between rural and urban or between sort of industrial science and agrarian science could have been really interesting because farmer brown is clearly supposed to be like leaning into this sort of air quotes, dumb hick stereotype, but he's also obviously a brilliant geneticist. It feels like there could be something there, but then there isn't. And that's the downside. But the upside is visually, I love him. So prepare everybody real quick for uh, spoilers on a 35 year old horror movie, apparently. But uh, if they did not base Farmer Brown on the evil preacher ghost from Poltergeist 2, I will eat my hat. Like, I just don't believe it. That is absolutely what they were going for. Agree or disagree? I've got to call Bruce Tim. I got him on the hotline. I really want to see you eat a hat. So I don't know. <laughs> no, I just uh, no, I'm no. telling you, even if he said that wasn't what they were doing, I wouldn't believe them. Like you no, just look I, at it and you're like, no, that's no, a lie. That's what you're doing. A hundred percent. No, no. I, Joshua, I actually, no, I kid. I a hundred percent agree with you. It looks like a very... Uh, lazy yeah sure i'll just say a lazy rip off of uh, a thing we've seen done in other things that again to your point could have been interesting and by the way i'm not saying that we should portray people from the hills as hillbillies as like horror movie monsters uh there's actually some really great movies out there that subvert that trope uh but gosh hillbillies have potential to be scary and they definitely like he has the scary elements but he just never quite gets there <laughs> Yeah, I really do feel like, like, for instance, if you look at the evil preacher ghost from Poltergeist 2, I wouldn't immediately go, oh, evil farmer, right? So in, in from that perspective, this is a really clever pull, right? I wouldn't have guessed that, but as soon as they do it, I'm like, hey, that actually works pretty well. Like, like super villain farmer, I get it. And I wouldn't even hate seeing Farmer Brown become some kind of, you know, semi-regular, low Bs, into the C-list Batman villain. I just think there's so little going on in the rest of this episode. They, they almost fail his design with the rest of the episode. <laughs> he's got a good voice and he looks creepy and he's got a strong, his, his daughter is, again, oh, yeah. yeah, it's just tropey. 
but I guess that's supposed to add to the persona. I don't know. So here's Emmy Lou. Yeah, let's talk about Emmy Lou. Um, okay, so they call it out in the episode. She's literally Ellie Mae Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies. And the thing about Ellie Mae Clampett is she is a living version of Tex Avery's farmer's daughter stereotype from like Looney Tunes cartoons. It's it is like a doubled up farmer's daughter stereotype. It's it's like farmer's daughterception, you know, like it just swallows its own tail. Um and I think I think in theory, if we put aside the objectification of the entire concept, yep. She kind of works for me, right? Like if if we assume that Farmer Brown is a clever idea. And if we're honest, he's he's really only about, you know, maybe a th- two thirds of a clever idea. But if we assume that he's a clever idea, then she gets more clever, right? She fits the aesthetic. She is supposed to be this mere slip of a girl who then turns out having super strength. I like her like hoisting Bullock over her head. If nothing else, visually, they do exactly what they mean to do with her. It's like, again, I want to like this idea more. But mm-hmm. on top of the kind of low level objectification and sexism that's wrapped up in it, she's reflecting Farmer Brown's glory, which, as we mentioned, is only so glorious. So I don't know. Do you do you disagree with any of that take? Do you have a different feel about Emmy Lou? I f- agree that um, I have just mixed feelings. I think visually <laughs> you're right. Visually, the idea of a, a woman hoisting Bullock over her head is kind of awesome, especially when he's not expecting it. So, yeah, like I like that stuff. It I can't put my finger on it. Maybe you could weigh in here. It, it feels like it's definitely um, a stereotype, like a redneck woman stereotype. Uh, I don't really know how to say it. It just feels very uh, caricature in a way. Yeah. Yes. No. Um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. That's wor- kind of what I was getting at with, that, with yeah. Ellie Mae and the Tex Avery reference is that this is, um, I mean, I don't think it's an, as established a trope now, like moving into, you know, the 2020s, but it's definitely a look and feel that I was familiar with, again, from Beverly Hillbillies reruns, which, you know they're not really doing anymore so it's fallen off and tex avery cartoons which again if i i was the kid who knew who tex avery was if i went and said tex avery to my own kid he'd be like i what you know um but yeah it's it's she's very derivative she's absolutely derivative and not in a way that's accidentally clever like farmer brown kind of winds up being yeah yeah so let me let me just i think if i was going to sum it up I'm sort of just sort of processing this in real time. So listeners bear with us. But like, I think whenever you use caricature and archetype, you have to be really intentional when you do it. And I don't know, like, you know, you need to be saying something about the caricature or trying to deploy a certain like plot element yeah. that you can only yeah. get. And again, visually, while I find it striking and I find the the gimmick kind of fun, kind of funny and sort of not really, but it could have been funny. I just don't really know that, her using that caricature or archetype in this episode really adds anything to it other than that those visual moments that are kind of cool yeah it, it and if we wanted to show up with our very feminist film critique hats on we could definitely find a lot of bad stuff about emmy oh, like, yeah. like it's you know it's not it's not great so anyway um i feel like the other designs that are worth talking about are Farmer Brown's series of giant evil animals. Oh, God. Um, uh. <laughs> okay. All right. I have these in kind of order, ascending order, right? Like from worst to best, worst to okay. most interesting, I think. Um, tell me if you disagree. So the first one, of course, and this actually is chronolo- well, almost chronological, uh, are the mantises, which I think are just okay right like i mean they're giant mantises i think the most terrifying thing about them is when they literally fall to pieces which is horrifying oh yeah no no totally Uh, so here's the one thing i'll say about the mantises uh design pretty lame i did think that maybe this is me just looking grasping for like silver linings (laughs) in this episode i did the think oh it's a bug in the salad where i thought that was kind of funny yeah (laughs) no okay yes i will i will come back to how the really terrible jokes are kind of the best part of this episode. Like, like I, yeah. you know, there and there are a lot of them. And in any good episode, I would be like, can we cut this fat? But here, that kind of stuff is great. Um, 
stepping up to the next level, I think the giant terrifying cows are very good. Like they're not brilliant, but they're they're obvious. Let's say this: they're obviously cows, right? But also monster cows, and that's good. Like it's fine. You're doing the thing. Listen, I'll circle back to the cows and my alternate media recommendations. But let me just say this: when the episode <laughs> opened, I was like, wait. Is this did, did this other movie rip off of this episode? And, oh, and listener, maybe yeah. maybe they got some light inspiration, but uh, the movie that I'm going to recommend is way better. So anyway, but there's some oh, there was some, a moment of like overlap where you're like, oh, wait a second. Anyway, uh, but the cows were yeah they were cool. Yeah, they're fine. They're good. You know they do their job. Uh, now the chickens, which are honestly more vultures than chickens. I don't know what they're doing, but I like it. I think that monster chickens are great. I wish that they were a little more chickeny, you know, just just because it's so ridiculous, like kind of like the cows, you know, like let's yeah. contrast the ridiculous with the monstrous. So I wish they were a little more like chickens, but I like them anyway, like monster vultures that are also sort of pterodactyls. Sure. Give it to me, baby. I'll take well, it. And I like I like how they chase Bullock around the pen too. That <laughs> that was that was probably my favorite part of the episode. <laughs> and so. they give us some good like like reasons to get off the ground. You know, we get some aerial stuff with Batman. You know, dog fighting with them. Like they're they're a, they're not only like kind of scary to look at. They're a good excuse for some you know some other unexpected or more interesting things to happen. Um, okay, now. We need to be careful not to turn this entire podcast episode into us gushing about this thing. But that talking goat that oh, delivers God. the ultimatum oh. is the most shocking, horrifying, and also kind of ridiculous while also I'm kind of, uh, yeah. oh my God, I love that talking goat. Like it's Listen. scary and weird and kind of uncomfortably funny all at the same time. It is by far the best thing that happens in this episode. Oh, by, by a mile. So I just have to say right now, I, I went through phases of this, of, uh, of appreciating this goat, but I will say first <laughs> off, I was like, holy cow, no pun intended. Uh, holy cow. It is uh, nightmare fuel. Like yes! this is the kind of like haunted goat that you see in your nightmares that's chasing you around and won't stop talking to you. So so stage one is fear. Stage two is this is really weird. Stage three is it's darkly funny. It, it, so, it really is all those things. I mean, the stuff we liked about the cows and chickens and the stuff that we thought was kind of lazy about the mantises, like all comes home to roost in this talking goat. If they had brought the level of artistry to this episode as a whole that they brought to just that scene with the talking goat, this would be an A++ episode that we are we would still be talking about constantly. It would be on lists all over the place. Man, but it isn't because that scene is the only scene that they loved, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, maybe that's what maybe that was the thing. They were like, what if we had a talking goat? And like, yeah, let's how do we how do we fit that into an episode? Well, we have to find a villain who would who would create this talking goat. Man. I don't know. Uh, Man. This is definitely the strongest point of the, the entire episode. That's the one thing I'll remember uh, about critters at the end of the day. Listen, listeners, I'm not giving this away, but it's so good that Caleb and I were discussing how we could build an entire horror movie around that thing. Uh, oh, yeah. We're not talking about it here because I kind of want to do it but man it's so evocative anyway talking goat a plus plus the best part of the whole episode bar none um but i got a couple other things i like okay like we'll see and and, and i think you're going to be surprised because i think that you're going to be like this is the stuff you usually hate uh, go on okay Okay, well, wait, wait, wait. Here's one one thing you know I always like. A little bit of secret identity shenanigans, right? So at the very oh, beginning, yeah. Yeah. when Bruce stops the giant bull and then yes. tells Gordon he was looking for a window to jump out of. Yeah, yeah. He's like a good Fantastic. call, Wayne. He's like, oh, I was just looking for the, yeah. No, I was looking for the window to jump out of. No, that was awesome. I Spectacular. love Spectacular. I love it. Okay, but going from there, they have the audacity to have Robin say, holy cow. Holy cow. Which, man, I mean, on one hand, it's like, how could you not do that, considering everything we know about, you know, Robin from Batman 66 and all that stuff. But th you got to remember, this is deep in the territory of where everybody was pretending that they were super embarrassed by Batman 66. So it's amazing that they went with Holy Cow. And it led directly into a giant bull running into a china shop. <laughs> 
how <laughs> dare they make me enjoy that joke? How dare they? And then, and then, Batman drowns the mutant chickens in barbecue sauce. <laughs> Those poor animals. Batman's a monster. I just well look. We already know he's sometimes he's uh, he's killed saber toothed tigers and uh, and and knocked alligators out and and also on the other hand this is let's let's lay the blame where it's due. Farmer Brown made these friggin' monstrosities, but also oh, totally. maybe he didn't have to be so clever about taking them out. Like oh look, a literal barbecue chicken wing factory. Let's take them in there. That'll be great. And then drown yes. them in barbecue sauce. It's it's fantastic. I, I mean, it's I, terrible, but it it circles back around to me loving it. I, I think uh, the the only other thing that really, I mean, yes, the, the puns were, I chuckled a little bit. I, I, did, I do have to say, the one joke that really landed with me was the one at the end of the episode where they're, they're trapped and Bullock says, <laughs> so you beat the Joker and all those other creeps, but you're going to bite it. You're going to bite the bullet because of Jed Clampett and giant bugs. And I got to live to see it. <laughs> Man. Yes. W- wow. If it weren't for the talking goat, Bullock would have the best scene in the episode. And it would be that one. It is. That is just a pure Bullock moment. Shoot it right in my veins and or eyeballs. I like it a lot. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we're wrapping up here, uh, but we do, I think you and I were both confused, similarly confused by the ending. We have praised the kind of Paramount movie monsters ending in the past, both on New Batman Adventures and more, I think, on Superman the Animated Series. But what do they think they're doing with this farm of Dr. Moreau ending? What are they even up to? They knew they weren't coming back to this well. Come on. Well, Joshua, it's like they panned over to the island and I was like, is this like... Are we foreshadowing? I, I, I felt like we pretty much wrapped it up. I didn't feel like there was a, a cliff left to hang on. Right. So it was, it was like, dun, dun. I was like, but there's nothing there. We did, this is call, case closed. It's, yes, it's case closed. And what are they going to do? Not go over there and clean it up? Like, like it's. It, I half expected the entire Bat family to turn there and Batman to be like, a job well done. And Robin to be like, what about the island? Nope, a job well done. Because it's, <laughs> what are you doing? Anyway, it's, yeah, I, again, broadly, I love the idea of giving us, you know, opportunities to come back, but it, it, there's just, there's just no way they actually planned on coming back to this. The liars, liars. And, and like, like, are you telling me they actually believe this episode was so good that it deserved a follow up? I, oh, no, no. Oh my gosh. Okay. And let alone that they're basically telegraphing that the next one would just be the animals run amok and maybe not even involve Farmer Brown when Farmer Brown's look is kind of along with the talking goat. Oh my God, Caleb. I just realized what if they had come back and it was the animals that were the threat and not Farmer Brown and they were led oh, by that talking goat? That's the only way this would have been good. Oh my that's God. That's amazing. Joshua, the, the pitch Warner Brothers. HBO Max is looking for some original <laughs> content these days. Let's pitch him. Let's let's wow. make a movie about that story. Wow. I want to watch it. Oh my gosh! Yes, Animal Farm, <laughs> Gotham Animal Farm. Wow. Okay. All right. You know what? You know why that's better? Because it's building on the terrifying goat monster, and because it's about something. We just turned it into superhero Animal Farm. Okay. I think I'm done bagging on critters, Caleb. Let's assume. <laughs> That people that are listening to this podcast also found a couple of things to enjoy about Critters. Um, If they were things that aligned with the tiny number of things we enjoyed, what kind of stuff do you think they should be watching, reading, listening, or experiencing? So the only thing that immediately came to mind, and I already sort of tipped my hand earlier in the conversation, but... Uh, the when they when when Farmer Brown introduces the giant cow, he's like talking about how there's all those different types of meat. So it's like we just need to use this one version of the cow to make all the meat we could ever want, and that is basically the premise of Bong Joon Ho's uh, Netflix film Okja. Like Okja, they they, they they like basically these animals have been genetically engineered uh, to be all of the meat that we eat, like all in one animal. Uh, they like they. They have to raise them a certain way. Essentially, the movie is about um, a boy falling in love with with Oakjaw, one of the animals. And then when the the big evil corporation comes to take the animal back so they can butcher him, 
uh, the, 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 the boy ha- decides to pursue him to f- liberate him. Um, anyway, it's a great, it's actually a great movie. It sounds kind of bizarre, uh, but it's an excellent movie. It's on Netflix. It's from the Oscar winning director of Parasite, Bong Joon-ho. Check it out. If you like the idea of uh, genetically engineered animals being misunderstood, Oakjaw, check it out. <laughs> Joshua, what do you got? Well... I honestly am so glad that you came up with a suggestion that has a real heart because I really struggled with this, partly because I just don't think it was a very good episode, obviously. But also the only thing this is so weird. I'm not sure that I can explain it. And I'm interested to see if you get me, even if you can't explain why I feel this way. For whatever reason, this episode makes me want to watch Tremors. Oh, I mean, Tremors is a great movie. It is. Bonafide, it is. Like on its movie. own merits, you should just be watching Tremors. But I I can't, I don't know if it's like monsters and kind of a rural setting. I, I, you know, kind of some hicks meet monsters. I can't lay my finger on exactly why. But for whatever reason, ex- watching this episode just made me go, yeah, Tremors, you guys. Tremors. I don't know. But that's my recommendation. <laughs> Giant sandworms coming to eat people. It's great. I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess it, it's basically the premise of this episode. Kind of. You know? Except for the, those are the, except for the trimmer worms are not genetically engineered or from an evil farmer. They're just prehistoric worms, I think. I'm just being honest with you. I don't know why my neurons are firing that way, but they're firing so hard. I couldn't think of anything else. So friends, watch Tremors. Just even if, the, even if you divorce it entirely from critters. In fact, Divorce it entirely from critters and watch Tremors. That about wraps it up for this animated discussion. If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, come find us on Twitter. Caleb is at Seamasters Talk and I'm at Joshua Unruh and the hashtag is animated discussion. Caleb, where else can people find you? Well, I'm the editor-in-chief and a contributor at The Cinematropolis, a website that specializes in in in-depth film critique and analysis. We also have our podcast, The Cinematic Schematic, and we are currently winding down a special interview series, three films that got you through the 2020 pandemic, where I talk to different members of the Oklahoma film community uh, just to learn a little bit more about how the pandemic impacted those different lines of work. So you can find that podcast, The Cinematic Schematic, as well as our in-depth essays on all types of films over at thecinematropolis.com. Remember that an animated discussion is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. Show your support by pledging at Patreon or by leaving a great review on Apple Podcasts to make it easier for more people to find us and join in the discussion. And of course, the links to Patreon, Apple Podcasts, our uh, other media recommendations, and Twitter are all easy to find in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining us for this animated discussion. We'll be back next time to talk about the Superman the Animated Series episode, Mixel Pixelated. We'll see you back here. Same bat time, same bat channel.